How was everybody's morning so far? Great. That's good to hear. Good to hear. And you guys started last night, right? Yeah. Right on. Some of you. Good. Get a bunch of men together and the shots are going to come. Well, looking out, I see that all the important guys are here, so we'll go ahead and start. So welcome. I'm David Chong. Um, these laws have about the recently passed anti-gun legislation in California. These, these laws have the most profound effects on California gun owners since the assault weapons ban of 1999. Uh, there's many firearms, accessories, many standard practices that we all do and enjoy and own uh, that are currently legal that will instantly become felony illegal items or practices overnight on January 1st. Uh, there's so many new laws and the state is doing nothing to educate or warn current gun owners about the changes. Uh, you could wake up a felon on January 1st having done nothing differently than what you've always been doing. Um, this morning we're going to walk you through what you need to know and then we're going to give you the tools to decide what you're going to do about it. So uh, I join, I'd ask you to join me now in prayer over our time. <laughs> Abba, Father, we are comforted by your presence. Well, we know that you've promised that uh, wherever we gather together, so too you are. So, Father, we ask you to just bless this time. Uh, I ask you to perfect my message as it uh, comes from my imperfect lips. Uh, send your Holy Spirit, Lord, so that these men, each individually, uh, hear your word that you have for them. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as men. Uh, together we are uh, strengthened. Iron sharpens iron. Uh, Lord, we dedicate this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm David Chong, owner of AO Sword Firearms. A, a little about my background. Uh, I served in the 152nd TAC Recon Squadron. Uh, for a year. After that, I was transferred to uh, um, Air Force uh, OSI, Office of Special Investigation. I served in Region 6 uh, and then Region 7 later uh, as a global counterterrorism agent uh, doing field operations. Um, after that, I uh, was a DHS counterterrorism proctor. Uh, I was the lead instructor at CSTI. Uh, CQC responders and our military in domestic counterterror, counterintelligence, and CQC, which is close quarters combat uh, techniques. Uh, after I got out, I was a risk manager and compliance administrator in the mining and uh, utilities industries for about six years. Um, and then most recently, in 2013, I founded AO Sword Firearms, Alpha Omega Sword Firearms. I'm the president and uh, licensed and certified experienced gunsmith. Um, Alpha Omega Sword is exactly what it sounds like. It's a reference to God. Um, that is where I place my faith and my trust. Uh, the sword uh, is many faceted. Uh, um, it, it forms my logo. You guys are welcome to grab a card later. Um, that sword, of course, makes a cross. It also symbolizes uh, a warrior's tool. And by being downturned, it symbolizes a warrior who is at rest, at peace, but he is prepared for battle. Um, uh, my, my son asked me, Dad, you know, you, you always talk about being a, an agent of peace and, and grace and forgiveness, but you're always training for battle. Why is that? And I tell him, son, it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. <laughs> so, um, that sword also has a much deeper meaning. It is, it is uh, um, not just that representation of a warrior's tool, used to be a sword, now it's a, a firearm, but, but the real weapon, the real defense of a warrior of God is not a physical sword, but the sword of the Spirit, yes. right? The Word of God. Yes. That is what we first arm ourselves with. Yes, so, that forms my premise, that it is, it is biblical to defend ourselves. 
and to provide for the safety and welfare of our families and our households. First Timothy tells us, failing to do this is to deny your faith and is worse than being a non-believer. So I take that to heart. <clears throat> yeah, he said, it says infidel. That's, that's actually the, the direct translation, but the New Living uh, Translation, you know, it softens that. So, uh, you know, in this premise, I just do want to address what some people consider to be the elephant in the room as we uh, talk about defending ourselves. There's, there's questions about uh, turning the other cheek and grace and pacifism. Well, or also something that is brought up is uh, if you're preparing to defend yourself, isn't that demonstrating a lack of faith? Shouldn't we be t depending on God to defend us and protect us? Absolutely, we do depend on God. It, we, all of our efforts are as to nothing compared to God's efforts over our lives. Is that right? Um, that doesn't mean that we're just supposed to sit back and, and hang out and just say, well, you know, God will provide. No, he wants us to work for our own provision, for our own uh, safety, and, and he will work through us, but we have to be his hands and feet. Um, King David wrote in Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And we're, clearly, we're supposed to rely on God. However, this does not conflict with him praising the God who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle in Psalm 144. I would point you to my favorite book, Nehemiah. We prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. The house of Ju Judah rebuilt Jerusalem with one hand on the work. You know where their other hand was? On their sword. That's correct, because they were under ever-present threat from an outside force. So Nehemiah gives us a perfect model for how we are to provide for our own defense. We prayed to the Lord our God first, because our efforts can't be for anything without God's blessing, without the anointing of God. Uh, and we posted a guard day and night. So they did both. They didn't just say, oh, we got this, God. They prayed first, and then they provided for their own defense. So what about pacifism? Aren't Christians supposed to be pacifists? Didn't Jesus say, hey, turn the other cheek? Uh, well, he also said that if you don't have a sword, go out and buy one. So how do we reconcile that? Did God change his mind? No, God, God doesn't change his mind. God doesn't change one of the most uh, uh, consistent themes in the Bible is that uh, God is unchanging, God is eternal. So let's, let's examine that. When Jesus said, turn the other cheek, I want you to pay close attention to how he couched that. He said first, you may have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. When he rebukes false teachings, he says, you may have heard it said. When he rebukes um, uh, false, falsehoods, absolute falsehoods, he quotes the word by saying, it is written. Now, thank you very much. Now, in uh, Exodus, it says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But see, in Jesus' time, uh, people were taking that out of context. It was originally written as a prescription for fair punishment according to the crime. It was a directive for how magistrates should dole out judgment and punishment. People were reinterpreting that to say, as an interpersonal relationship advice, if someone takes my eye, I should take their, their eyes. No, that is not what the Word of God said. That was, that was for magistrates, not for brothers. So he says, you may have heard it said, but he says that as, as brothers, we are to treat each other with mercy, grace, and forgiveness. So then on the other hand, um, uh, when he said, uh, if you don't, he who doesn't have a sword should sell his cloak and buy one. Um, some people say, oh, well, that was figurative. It was just meant to be a metaphor for the coming troubles. Uh, look, he said two swords is enough. And then just an hour later in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Peter draws his sword and Jesus says, hey, put that back. So they use that as an argument that, oh, Jesus didn't actually mean that we were to have swords. That is, that is absolutely not true. 
uh, in uh, Ecclesiastes, what do we learn? There's a time and a place for everything, right? A, a, a season, uh, there is a, a time for war and a time for peace. This was not the time. You, if, you, if you read your Bible, you know that Peter has been famous for 2,000 years for being a little bit impulsive. This was, this was not the time for him to draw his sword. He's surrounded by Roman guards. He will be absolutely slaughtered if he tries to resist. And Jesus is also saying, you know, even if you were successful in getting out of this, you would be uh, an obstacle to the fulfillment of the word, the fulfillment of the law. I am here. My work is ahead of me on the cross. You are, you are not to save me from the cross with your sword. So he says, put that back. This is not the time. He don't say, doesn't say never use a sword. He said, this is not the time. So that is the premise that I believe, uh, my premise that we have a biblical foundation for uh, keeping and bearing arms. It's also a constitutional foundation. But ultimately, which law do we rely on? First, the, the word of God, God's law. So what has happened? Seven new laws were passed, making currently legal firearms, accessories, and practices uh, illegal after January 1st. There's some that take effect later. Where we're going to talk about all of them and the timing. It's important to note that these laws have already been passed. There's going to be a lot of confusion. Uh, you know, on our ballots this November, we have Proposition 63, where you're going to recognize basically all of this language, um, banning this and that, and uh, turn in that and the other, and, and felony this and that. Uh, it only reinforces the laws that are already on the books. And if we vote it down, these laws still apply. So we're in double jeopardy here. Um, there, the one significant impact that, that, those, uh, that Proposition 63 would have is uh, if it passes, the timeline of the implementation of the laws that are already on the books may, is maintained. If Prop 63 fails, many of those timelines are pushed back a half year or a year. That's about it. Separately, I want you to know that... Uh, I, I'm sorry, I talked about the, the Prop 63. So who thinks the new gun laws are going to keep us safer? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, you know, in, uh, in, in the beginning, Genesis, uh, Cain killed Abel with a rock. So all you all seen rocks lately? Yeah, God, God didn't ban rocks. He, he, as the creator, he could have uncreated rocks, right? No, he banished Abel. As murder is in the heart, and it's not in, not in a rock. What's happening next? There are radical changes coming on January 1st, 2017. We're going to go through that. Uh, Assembly Bill 1135 and Senate Bill 880 are the same. They basically say this. Any centerfire uh, uh, center semi-automatic firearm with a detachable magazine um, will be illegal if it has any of the following features. A pistol grip, a uh, foregrip, forward pistol grip, like this one. See that forward pistol grip right there? An adjustable stock, like this. Or a flash hider, like this. So what can you have besides a flash hider? A muzzle brake, that's right. So there's a flash hider. There's a muzzle brake, thanks to the wisdom of the California State Legislature. If you get hit by a bullet with a muzzle brake, it won't hurt. <laughs> All right, so um, the, the, the big change is that, that so, so far, none of, nothing's different. That's, that's already been the law for uh, 16 years. What has changed is that they're no longer recognizing this little device right here called a magazine lock, or uh, uh, there's a brand name for it, bullet button. Yep, that, that makes it so I can't push this to, to drop the magazine. I have to get a little sharp tool like the head of a bullet to push in that little hole right there, and that will drop the magazine for me. 
the, the, the reasoning was, well, since technically it is fixed, it is stuck in there unless I use a tool, it, by the definition of the law, it can't be readily released from the firearm. They're saying, oh, now, specifically, bullet buttons are illegal. If you can use a tool to drop the magazine, that is considered an assault weapon. So um, what does that mean? Well, California law now says that if you have an assault weapon and you register it, you can keep it. But then you can never, uh, but at that point, once you register it, California assault weapons, then you can fill this in, can't be bought or transferred by California residents in California after December 31st, 2016. The reason I'm having you write that down is because I want you to remember, if you do not own uh, an AR-15 or an AK-47 or a Mini-14 that's got a conversion stock on it, in, uh, anything with a pistol grip, basically, that's a centerfire rifle, by December 31st, you will never be able to buy one again in California. There's a few exceptions. We'll talk about that. But the, basically, the AR-15, as you know it, will be dead after December 31st. Yeah, sure. So if you were to follow the law and register it as an assault weapon, you could put whatever you want on it after that point, right? We will talk about that later. That's, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, so we're talking about registered assault weapons. Now that they are registered, they are providing you with a window to register what you already own as an assault weapon. If you do register it, and uh, we will talk about this in detail, but if you do register it, all California assault weapon rules apply. In addition to that not being able to buy it or transfer it, also you, you can't transport it uh, anywhere you want. It has to be to specifically state-approved locations by type. Uh, you, you can't, it can't be with you in the car to the grocery store. You can't be headed to the range and, and stop at the grocery store to buy some Gatorade on the way. You have to go straight there, straight back. You can come to my shop or somebody else to, to get gunsmithing work or something done, but you can't drive around with it. It has to be locked. It has to be unloaded. Unlike uh, these rifles, which currently, even the same exact rifles currently, you can have them in your car unloaded. Um, they are also illegal to loan. Your buddy, if your buddy's going hog hunting, you can't loan him your AR-15 anymore because now it'll be an assault weapon. Um, there's specific language about how you may possess them. And most concerning, you're submitting to a, some, anywhere at their discretion, the D Department of Justice can inspect you anywhere between once a year and once every five years. And they can come into your house and take an inventory of your registered assault weapons, make sure that you don't have any others that should have been registered, and verify that you have compliant storage for them in a full-size California-approved gun safe. It can't just be a gun lock at home, it has to be a gun safe on an assault weapon. So we will, we will chew on this stuff later. I just want to get out to you and, uh, the, the changes in the bills so that you can understand what's coming. Assembly Bill 1511, felony to lend any gun, not just assault weapons. I'm talking about your 22 pistol or your, your Ruger 1022 rifle. It's a felony to lend that to anyone outside of your immediate family, your grandparents, and vice versa. So I can no longer lend my 308 hunting rifle to a buddy to go on a, a hunting trip because he was lucky enough to pull tags this year and I wasn't. Assembly Bill 857. It's a felony to mill out an 80% receiver into a firearm without prior permission from the state. Who knows about 80% receivers? Everybody? Some people not raising their hands, so I'll, I'll go over it quickly. An 80% receiver is currently a perfectly legal opportunity for you to build and own your own off-the-record, off-the-books firearm. It starts as a, as a hunk of metal. It's filled in, and by taking a Black & Decker drill press to it with a jig, you can hollow out the fire control area so that you can put a trigger in there. Uh, directions are actually pretty easy. If you have moderate mechanical skill, you can get it done successfully. If you have 
minor mechanical skill, you can mess it up and then bring it to me to fix. <laughs> but um, once you've done that, this is a legitimate legal firearm that doesn't have to be registered as long as you made it by yourself for yourself. A lot of people do kind of fringe classes that actually are not just gray area anymore. They're, they're actually illegal. People do them anyway. That's, that's not, on, not on me. I don't know anything about that. But <laughs> after you make it into a, a full-fledged firearm, it's legal for you to paint it, put it together, do whatever you want. This is, this is one of my prized possessions that, thanks to these new laws, uh, I'm going to have to give up or, uh, or destroy. Um, this is a custom rifle that I... Uh, um, I built for my wife. Uh, it's an unregistered firearm. It uh, has her favorite verse from Galatians 2.21. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Got a little, got a little sweet pea there. Um, on, on the safe setting, it says grace. On the fire setting, it says wrath. <laughs> At, over here, I can't move it there, it won't go there, but if it could go full auto, there's even a little word that says, rapture. <laughs> she, she has fun with that one. <laughs> um, so it's a felony, felony to, to do it without their permission. And here's what's really scary. It, as of January 1st, it will be a felony to possess a completed, home-built gun without a state-issued registration. That's, that's chilling, guys. That, that is a direct violation of the ex post facto law, which is mentioned twice in the U.S. Constitution. What that says is, uh, if I am a farmer and I, uh, I thresh wheat and I, get, I harvest grain uh, today, uh, you can't tell me tomorrow that we're writing a law making harvesting grain illegal and then punish me for it. I did it when it was legal. And you also can't punish me for having the grain that's the fruits of my labor. I, I made that. I, I harvested that. You can't later make it illegal and then go back and punish me for having done it and punish me for having it. Uh, that's exactly what this does. It is currently legal for you to make this and possess it. They're writing a law saying now it's illegal to make and it's illegal to possess. But I already made it and possessed it when it was legal. It's a violation of the U.S. Constitution. Nonetheless, they passed the law. Yes? Under... Under current, it's a good question. What, what is considered a completed firearm is the question. Is it, is it, does that mean that it's all the way built into a gun, or what about this? Just the lower receiver is the answer. This is a very important distinction and one that is not changing and uh, is important for all, all of us to understand both currently and moving forward, and we'll talk about that later in the session, uh, which is coming up. Um, the law, federal law, I'm not talking just about California law, federal law considers this the firearm. This right here, not the trigger, not the things that go in it, not the magazine, nothing but that one piece is the firearm. So today, now, tomorrow, uh, next year, uh, I could take this entire very gun-looking thing, wouldn't you agree? And, and I can sell that to my buddy Chris and say, here's, you got five bucks, uh, this is yours. And uh, We don't need licenses, we don't need registration, nothing. This is the only thing that is an actual firearm under the eyes of the law. So the answer is, this is what counts as a firearm. If this is what you have, that's a firearm. And that will be illegal to possess if it's not serialized and registered with the state. Um, is that, is that clear? Um, Senate Bill 1235. This one is the first one we're going to talk about that isn't immediately effective. This is going to an effect January 1st, 2018, if, 
uh, um, Prop 63 passes. If, if Prop 63 doesn't pass, it's just going to be delayed about half a year. Ammo, and this is chilling. Let me get through it. Ammo may only be purchased from a licensed California ammunition dealer in a storefront. That's a problem. Um, let's say, well, uh, let's say that uh, um, tomorrow the state says, you may only purchase gasoline from the following 250 authorized gas stations. What's going to happen to the price of gas? It's going to skyrocket, right? So this is specifically saying um, it's a felony to purchase ammunition without a background check, to purchase it online, purchase it over, over the mail. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of look behind the curtain. I, I, I work very hard at being very fair in my retail firearm store. Um, uh, I am usually on guns. I'm the, I'm the cheapest guy in town. I don't have sales because my prices are always priced right. And they're also priced where I, where I can stay in business and continue to provide a service. Um, on ammunition, I barely squeak by. No let me put it another way. No matter how much ammunition I sold, um, I could not make a business uh, uh, and employ people and keep the lights on selling ammunition because I don't want to punish my customers for shopping with me. My customers will spend, you know, an extra five or ten bucks on a on a thousand dollar items to to uh, to support me. But if it's uh, double, well, I'm, they're being punished for for the, for the privilege of supporting me. So. Currently, even though uh, manufacturers' suggested retail price on a box of 50 9 millimeter rounds is like $25, I sell it for 16 or 17. And the reason why is because you can get it for 15 or 16 online, um, including shipping and stuff. I'm, so you're paying an extra dollar for the privilege of getting it for me. But guys, I buy it for 14 bucks. I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't employ people at that. But, but that's okay. You're an ammunition. You're a gun store. You got to have ammo. You got to you got to supply it and have it there for people's convenience. If I was relieved of the artificial pressure of online wholesalers who sell for basically the prices I buy it for, you know, like I said, I pay 14, 15 bucks. They they sell it for 14 and 15, and by the time you add shipping and stuff and the hazmat fee, you get to about my price. Um, if I wasn't competing with that. I would mark it up towards a maintainable retail price. It wouldn't be 25. I'm still going to be fair and reasonable. I, I can survive on a margin of about 30 percent, so I'll mark it to 22 or something like that. And, and that's five dollars more per box that you're going to pay, not because I'm beating people up, but because now I'm just treating it like any other retail product. Um, you're going to have to get an ammo license, an ammo purchaser's license, which costs money every year. And you're going to have to pay for a background check every time you buy ammo. Every single time you come to my store or someone else's store, and remember, they're saying you have to buy in person, you're going to have to subject yourself to a background check, even though you have the permit. So um, I'm, once again, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I have to pay the guy to, to do the background check for you. There's going to be a small fee. I bet you the state's going to also charge you a pass-through fee to do the, the check. Um, so it's going to, so now get this catch-22, okay? So, so uh, that makes it um, not financially viable to, to buy one box, right? So you're going to save up until you really need it, and then you can buy 10 boxes of ammo. Well. There's a new caveat in the law that says anybody who buys a lot of ammo at once, they're a high-volume purchaser, and they get flagged. Hmm. What are you flagging them for? What are you going to do with that information? This is going to be through the same DOJ that does background checks on our weapons that Same DOJ that does background check on our weapon is going to do background checks on uh, ammunition. Hmm. You have a question? Yeah, I I, I do not know if that part is true. Uh, there is some there is some wonderings of um, are they going to allow you to buy ammunition if you don't have a registered 
uh, gun in that caliber because you would be suspected of uh, transferring it. That's not in the language, and it's, it's really, you know, I want to give you the straight facts and things that I know. I don't want to speculate. That's possible, but I don't know. Uh, I am sure that Arizona does not require ID to purchase ammunition. I also know, I also know for a fact that uh, um, the DOJ has begun uh, sting operations in Arizona looking for California plates, and they get you at the border crossing station. Uh, you're going, I'm, 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 What you, do, what you do in another state and, and consume in another state, and this is not, this is not conjecture, this is specifically, it, this is federal law. What you do over there as a protected uh, activity over there is not subject to the laws of California. Bringing ammunition back, even though it's your property, uh, may be a violation of the law. Um, I said may. So moving on, and I will take questions later. Um, it is a misdemeanor to sell or transfer ammunition without a license, even gifting or disposing of it. So uh, if, for example, you sell your 40 and you don't, you don't need 40, millimeter, uh, 40 caliber ammo anymore, um, uh, you can't say to your buddy, hey, do you want this stuff? I don't need it anymore. Uh, there is a misdemeanor penalty if, if that guy even could potentially turn around and sell that. Um, if you sell it, then, then you purchased for, with the intent to sell, uh, uh, potentially. <laughs> so the, the ammunition uh, bill is, is very concerning. Moving through these so that we can get to your other questions too. Um, Senate Bill 1446, it ends the grandfather provisions for magazines of 11 or more rounds. It will now be a felony to possess 11 or more round magazines in California with exceptions for a few obscure guns. Now, I don't want you to hang your hat at all on that exception. That's why I'm not really going into it too much. Uh, there's a very, very few really obscure guns for which uh, low capacity magazines of 10 or fewer rounds were never manufactured. Um, I can't name one right now. Uh, so so don't, don't think that that's going to be a worthwhile exception. Um, this will provide for confiscation without compensation for previously legally possessed magazines. Uh, I want to illustrate how this played out in history. In 1999, the state legislature passed a law saying, from now on, we're going to ban anything over 10 round magazines. So up until the end of the year, you guys have the right to buy as many high-capacity magazines, we call them standard-capacity magazines, um, anything over 10 rounds, you can buy them up until the end of the year, and if you have them by the end of the year, you can keep them in California. But after that, you can't buy any more. Well, um, they are going back on their word on that. They're saying, yeah, I know some of you went out and you spent way more than you wanted to spend or were planning to spend on, on those mag magazines because you couldn't own them anymore after, uh, excuse me, you couldn't buy any more new ones after 2000, so you bought up enough to last you the rest of the life. We'll turn those in because we're going back on our word. Even though we said you could legally keep them, now you can't. Turn them in, no compensation. That is, once again, a violation of the ex post facto law under the Constitution. Rounding out our uh, summary of the, uh, the new laws, Proposition 63 reaffirms many of the already passed laws and accelerates their implementation. Is everybody up to speed so far? We're going to start chewing on this now. We've got uh, 20 minutes, I think. What does this mean for me? All new felonies. Um, if, you, if you sit and do nothing, just having a... On, on January 1st, I wake up with this bullet button gun as, as a, a prosecutable felon, having done nothing differently. I wake up with all, well, I don't, but I'm, not a, I'm a special case. Uh, I'm a licensed FFL. All, my, my friends will all wake up with their legally possessed 30-round magazines that they had since back in the day. 
They will wake up with their uh, pistol magazines with 13, 14, 17 rounds that they had with their old pistols, their Beretta 9 millimeters or whatever from back in service or service Glocks from when they were uh, cops. And those become illegal. <clears throat> you are, you are uh, prosecutable as a felon for just doing nothing different. You are subject to seizure and loss of property without compensation under those two cases that I illustrated earlier. It's a violation of the Fifth Amendment. Um, what's coming are registration, if you choose to register these guns in order to avoid being a felon. Um, if you do register, then you are subject to all of the restrictions now of an assault weapon, such as not being able to transport it except to uh, authorized locations, etc. Um, I want to point out the historic precedent. In each, every, all, ever um, points of history where <coughs> guns were registered, including in the United States, that eventually led to confiscation and further or further restriction. Um, we don't need to go through all of the cases in history. Um, the, on, the, on the flip side, with the silver lining of this dark cloud, we do have a, now, a one-time opportunity that the state is giving us. To, they're saying, and, uh, we're, we're making it illegal for you to purchase this at the beginning of the year. You won't ever be able to purchase them again, but for anything you have before the beginning of the year, you can keep it. You can register it and keep it. Um, well, wait a minute. Do, does that sound familiar? Yeah, they said the exact same thing to us in 1999, and now 16 years later, they're changing their minds. They said the exact same thing. If you, you can't buy magazines anymore, but if you buy them before the end of the year, you can keep them. Now they're saying you, you can't buy AR-15s anymore, but if you have them by the end of the year, you can keep them. You just need to tell us about them with a registration database. It sounds like they are setting themselves up to do what they're doing today, isn't it? Ironic that in the same breath that they're going back on that promise from 1999, they're making a new promise that's the exact same. You can keep it if you already have it, you just need to register it. Um, more on that golden lining, though, uh, uh, the silver lining, you, you do, if you register it, get, ironically, uh, increased flexibility and functionality out of your AR-15. Currently, this is a perfectly legal firearm because it has a bullet button, so I can't release the magazine. Um, currently, this is a perfectly legal firearm. Uh, it's of appropriate length, and uh, it has this magazine lock here so that I can't take it out without using a little tool to put in there and oh, take out the magazine. If I register this as an assault weapon, well, uh, next year, I'll be able to take that off and, and drop the magazine just with my bare hands. I will be able to install a cool folding stock on it, which we Californians never get to play with, because as we all know, this will kill you. This is harmless, right? <laughs> <clears throat> but that's, that's interesting. Um, you, will, you will be able to run these guns, as God intended, with a detachable magazine, uh, collapsible, foldable stock, flash suppressor, vertical foregrip, whatever you want, pistol grip. It, it, just no 30 rounders, correct. Um, they'd be 10 round magazines. All right, that's what it means for me. What should I do about it? There's a little uh, set of blanks in there in, in your little study guide. The first option is to comply. That means to register the gun. Um, I've already, I just went over uh, the pros and cons. Um, registration does give you some kind of cool advantages that, uh, that we haven't had in, in California for quite some time. Um, you will be able to go out and, and play with your toys uh, or train on your tools uh, without fear of uh, repercussion because uh, any, anything that looks like this with a pistol grip after the first of the year, uh, can't, it begs the question, is it registered? Is it legal? Uh, um, many people I talk to in the shop are, oh, I'm just not going to register anything. Okay, well, 
how and where do you intend to use that? Well, I don't, I don't shoot at ranges. Okay, well, do you think that the United States government or the, the state government doesn't observe, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ocotillo wells? They're, they're out there and they're looking. Uh, and if you have an unregistered or an unserialized firearm uh, and you don't have a registration for it, you just lost your gun rights in California forever. Um, there's a lot of heartache over compliance with the 80 percenter ban. Um, we, in good faith, legally manufactured those guns specifically because we don't want to be felons. How many here have a friend that may or may not be named Bubba who would gladly sell you a, a gun face-to-face -face without going through a background check? And We all know how to get an unregistered gun. If, if not, I promise you, you ask you ask a friend, and you'll find somebody to sell you an unregistered gun off the books. That we chose to build these 80 percenters because we, uh, following God's word, we submit to the earthly authorities, and we follow the law. So the law said I could do it. I did it. I'm happy about it. Uh, I'm a good guy. Uh, Big Brother doesn't need to know that I own that gun because it's never going to do any harm to anybody. Uh, so compliance has pluses and minuses. The second option you have, and this is exciting, convert. Uh, you can convert your firearm to featureless. You can convert it to a locked magazine. It's different than the bullet button. This is going to be locked now. Or you can convert it to a 22 long rifle. That's very interesting. I'll explain. So this right here is a converted firearm. It is a featureless rifle according to the state of California. Notice it has a, a very nice grip. Uh, it's very ergonomic. Uh, it takes my whole grip. I can hold it with one hand. I can maneuver it with one hand because I've got kind of a cool setup here. But none of that is a pistol grip. You see that? So that is not a forward vertical grip which they ban. It's an angled grip. It has the muzzle brake, which is unfortunately loud indoors. That's a just drawback. Um, it has a fixed stock. Well, David, that looks like a collapsible stock to me. Well, I've removed the cross pin, so I can't uh, adjust it on the fly. However, I can take a tool and just put it in there and slide it back, uh, pull the pin down and slide it back and forth, but that's tool use. They banned bullet buttons, but they didn't ban tools for... Uh, adjustable stocks. <laughs> Lastly, I don't have a pistol grip on that. As you can see, there's nothing that can, uh, you know, extends conspicuously beneath the action. There's a bunch of really specific language on pistol grips, um, and it doesn't make any sense. Uh, we all know what a pistol grip is when we look at it. Um, that's hard to actually describe as a law. So California says, and you are welcome to mental floss this right out of your memory after I say it, but a pistol grip is defined as a, a, a weapon handle in which the webbing between the thumb and the forefinger can, uh, dis, uh, protrudes conspicuously behind the exposed portion of the top of the trigger beneath the action of the weapon. Uh, what? <laughs> That's what it says. So basically, this doesn't let my webbing do that. The, the, my webbing of my skin between the thumb and forefinger is stuck above the trigger. You see that? But it still allows me to grasp the weapon. I can operate it just fine. Uh, no one can take it from me. I can safely operate this weapon with a full grasp on, on the firearm. Uh, other people have another option, which is blocking off, taking, taking a regular um, grip, and they put a paddle back here to make it so you have to grab it like this. I promise you, if I run with this uh, firearm, it will fall out of my hands. Um, if, I, if I point it at somebody in close quarters, it's easily coming out of my hands. So I do not believe that that is a safe solution to making it a featureless rifle. While well, I've got this in my hand, here is a second option on converting the firearm. Keep all this stuff, keep this right here, but, and please ignore the, the upper on this for a moment, uh, this, this happens to have a short barrel, so it's a, a pistol, 
but the, the, the uh, concept still applies. Um, this doesn't have a bullet button at all. There is nothing I can do to push this. It is blocked. So um, to get around the new law, you can use a break action. OK? Yeah, it's not so bad. It's, uh, it's certainly not tactical. It's certainly not tactical. <laughs> but it works. But it works, yeah. This, this configuration right here uh, does not qualify as an assault weapon. You can put this device on your, on your gun. Uh, they're, they cost a lot. They're 60 bucks, but they know they have us over the coals, you know. There's, no, uh, there's only two guys making them. Uh, I do sell them. Uh, I don't love it. What I do like about it is on, on some very bad day, um, uh, it's about a three-minute conversion back to a U.S. government issue standard uh, magazine release. Uh, so this is an option. So you say that right there is a pistol? Uh-huh. I can run it like that. You could run it exactly like this, yes. Um, be careful. There's, there's a bunch of funny stuff going on here. See how this is not a stock? It's a buffer, it's a buffer tube. It goes like this. It, it's not supposed to go against my shoulder. Um, This is also a pistol. This is also a wrist brace. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. And this, this has any, any resemblance to a actual stock is purely coincidental. Just to clarify, so you have a 16-inch barrel, it's a rifle. Yeah. With the locking breech. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. So uh, the question was, just to clarify, is this locky thingy legal on a pistol or a rifle? Absolutely, you can do either one. Don't pinch your finger, it'll really hurt. Okay. So um, uh, those, are, those are options for converting your firearm so that it is not classified as an assault weapon and you don't have to register it as an assault weapon and you can still keep it. Um, <clears throat> The, the final blank there is covert. You can simply choose to not advertise, uh, not be visible, not to take it in public, go underground. It, basically, you're choosing noncompliance. See that TBA? That, that doesn't stand for to be announced. It stands for tragic boating accident. Yes, that's right, officer. <laughs> On December 30th, I had a tragic boating accident, and all of my guns and all of my magazines fell overboard. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, th that's one that really takes some soul searching, um, uh, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that. But uh, no, know that if you are discovered with any contraband, that the, as we've talked about, those, those are felonies, and you lose your, your lawful right to own firearms forever. There is no grace period. It doesn't, it doesn't expire. If you're a felon, you can't buy or, or possess firearms. Thank you for bringing me back to, uh, to my own notes. Um, the other way that you can get around this on an AR-15, specifically, but that's what a lot of us are thinking about, is with a very simple modification that takes is la exactly this long, you can put a somewhat expensive but uh, uh, affordable, it's like $250, um, 22 conversion bolt into your AR-15. It is now no longer, according to the law, a 223556 five, assault weapon. It is a 22 long rifle plink, plinkster. Okay? So uh, you can simply represent this rightfully and accurately as, as a 22. And 22 rim fires are not regulated by assault weapon law at all. As a matter of fact, a 22 uh, can have all of those features that we were talking about on the silver lining uh, 
It can be a folding stock. It can have a muzzle brake or a flash hider. It can have a vertical foregrip, all of that fun stuff, because 22s uh, do not fall un in, under uh, assault weapon law at all in California. Now, you can convert it back, obviously, by putting back in the other bolt. Yes, and you'd need some magazines. They're like 30 bucks. Yeah, it, it's 100% conversion. You just you just drop in the bolt, and now it's now it's a 22. It actually functions. You don't have to change the barrel. Nope, nope. So, <laughs> so one of the one of the chief complaints throughout time since Vietnam is this stupid Mattel thing. It's a it's a 22. <laughs> and that's right. That's they're right. It is a 22. Um, but a, a 20. You guys know what a 22 looks like. It looks like the tip of that. Well, what's cool is the, the 22 bolt conversion uh, handles all of that. There's, there's, uh, it, it, it does just drop in and the, the bullet goes into the bolt. There's a new chamber. The chamber's in the, in the thing that replaces the bolt. Yeah. Um, I have a bullet around here somewhere, but it's safely tucked behind. I, that obviously, even though they're the same diameter. A, a 22 long rifle is, is backed by a tiny, tiny little bit of powder. A, a, a 22, a, a 223 or a 5.56 has a rifle size cartridge behind it. So very different. Um, so that was answering the question, what should I do about it? Comply, convert, or go covert? We don't have much time in here, so I'm going to rush through this next part. Please bear with me. The question we really need to ask ourselves is, what does God say I should do about it? In 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17, he says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, circle that, please, the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. I'd like you to underline that. Punish those who do wrong, underline, commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the talk, the ignorant talk of foolish people. Let's go a little bit deeper into that word. Romans 13, 1 and 2, submission to the authorities. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority on, except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. This sounds pretty clear. We are called to submit to God and by extension to the authorities which he has instituted. Romans just said there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. He, um, Peter told us very specifically we were sub to submit to the supreme governmental authority as well as to those who administer that authority. Well, who is the supreme authority in the United States? The Constitution. That's, the, that's your fill-in right there. The supreme authority in the United States is the Constitution. When I took office, uh, I am an elected official. I don't know if any of you know that. Uh, I also serve on the uh, Board of Education for the Little Mesa Spring Valley School District, elected by the voters. I'm proud of our voters who will elect an arms dealer to a school board. We are, by the way, uh, just to our own home for a second, we are the only, only Southern California school district who allows our teachers to carry concealed firearms. We are not a soft target. I said, I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. So help me God. Yeah. You know who else takes that oath? The governor. The, governor, the military. Thank you. The president of the United States. The first thing that the president of the United States does when they take office, before they can do anything else, is they swear that oath to uphold and defend the, the Constitution. So American exceptionalism is a country founded on God's word by godly men. The emperor himself, or maybe the empress in a couple months, <clears throat> as the very first act in order to take office swears that oath. 
Romans 13, 7, and I'm wrapping up. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes. This is the very uh, end of the same passage that is, talks about uh, sub- submission to authorities. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Not taxes to everybody, right? Not pay all, uh, pay all to all. It says, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Isaiah 10 has a prescriptive uh, uh, word for how the governors should govern. Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees. So this is telling us God's will for the governors, right? Uh, And we also learned that it is God's will that the governors govern. So it is qualified submission to the appropriate authority that God calls us to. So what is God saying to me, wrapping it up? Weigh these things, brothers. Pray, reflect, ask God what he would have you do. If you were hoping that I would stand up here and tell you, so the answer is this, you know, comply or convert or covert. That's, that, it's not that easy. You have to take this to God yourself. Romans 14, 1 through 3, accept, open your hearts on this, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. For me, guess what? I'm, I'm on a lot of lists, so... It doesn't bother me at all to get on a few more and have a few registered assault weapons so that I can play and have fun and do all the things. Um, For others, um, that's a very serious consideration. Some people haven't bought a gun in 25 years. There, There hasn't been any gun registration in the time that they've had those guns. They don't have anything registered. They're not on any list. They have to consider that carefully. Still other people have a wife who has a consideration this way or that way. Consult her, brothers. How does she feel about it? Um, most of all, have a conversation with God about it. Have a conversation with your counselors, your mentors, your brothers. What is right for you is not going to be right for me. My point has been, hopefully, just to arm you with the information that you needed. I'm sorry I ran all the way through your question time. You know where to find me, guys. God bless you, and thank you very much.